Good afternoon and welcome. I have the honor of introducing the alumni medallion recipients for 2012. These honorees are truly extraordinary alums of Villanova University's College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and it's a genuine pleasure to recognize the achievements of these four outstanding graduates. So just introduce, going down in order here. First is Vice Admiral Nanette M. Dorenzi. She is the 42nd Judge Advocate General of the Navy. As the Judge Advocate General, Admiral Dorenzi is the Principal Military Legal Counsel to the Secretary of the Navy and Chief of Naval Operations. She serves as the Department of Defense Representative for Ocean Policy Affairs. As the JAG, I can say that, right? Okay. As the JAG, she also leads the 2,300 attorneys, enlisted legal men, and civilian employees of the Worldwide Navy JAG Corps. Admiral Dorenzi is a native Philadelphian and was raised in Pensacola, New Jersey. She graduated magna cum laude from Villanova University. She was commissioned through the JAG Corps student program and in 1986 she graduated from the Temple University School of Law. She later earned a Master of Laws degree in Environmental Law from the George Washington University School of Law. From 2009 to 2012, Admiral Dorenzi served as the Deputy Judge Advocate General of the Navy and Commander Naval Legal Service Command. As Commander Naval Legal Service Command, she led the Judge Advocates Enlisted Legal Men and Civilian Employees of 17 commands worldwide, providing prosecution and defense services, legal assistance services to individuals, and legal support to shore and afloat commands. Afloat, I like that term. Afloat, Admiral Dorenzi served as the Fleet <coughs> Judge Advocate to Commander, U.S. 7th and 3rd Fleets, as well as Staff Judge Advocate to Commander, Carrier Group 7. Admiral Dorenzi is admitted to practice before the courts of the State of New Jersey and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. The Admiral holds multiple awards and decorations, including the Navy Distinguished Services Medal, Defense Superior Service Medal, the Legion of Merit, the Meritorious Service Medal, and the Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal. We are most happy to welcome this highly decorated and most accomplished graduate of our college back to campus and thank her for her service to our nation and to the reputation of Villanova University. As we're working down the, the row of honorees, uh, born in Havana, Cuba, Afonso Al Martinez Fonts Jr. received his undergraduate degree in political science from Villanova University, and he serves on the Alumni Association Board. He received his MBA in finance from Long Island University. Mr. Martinez Fonts Jr. is the president of Alfonso Martinez Fonts LLC, a consulting firm specializing in homeland security and international issues. He is a fellow at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Some years ago, Mr. Martinez Fonts was appointed assistant secretary for the private sector office at the Department of Homeland Security. Serving at the department since it was founded, he worked directly with businesses and trade associations plus other non-governmental organizations to foster dialogue between the private sector and the United States government. His role and impact on American free enterprise is well described by the title of an article in Free Enterprise, Making Business Safe an interview with Department of Homeland Security's Alfonso Martinez Fonts, Jr. Mr. Martinez Fonts is a retired chairman and CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. He completed a 
plus year career in banking, including assignments in many foreign countries. <coughs> Mr. Martinez Francis served on multiple boards, including the Free to Lay Hispanic Latin Advisory Board, Fannie Mae Advisory Board, and the American Bankers Association Communications Council. Not only has he been honored by key appointments, but he has received the National Conference of Christians and Jews Humanitarian Award. We are honored to have him as a Villanova alum and welcome him warmly. And next we have um, Dr. Jennifer Gassetti Ferenze. I'm saying that correctly. Oh no, I'm sorry. It's, it's well, we'll go with that. Okay, I have my papers out of order. I'm sorry. I didn't. I should have checked the left. Dr. Jennifer Gassetti Ferenze is professor of philosophy at Fordham University and research associate for the Balzan Project on Literature as an object of knowledge at St. John's College, University of Oxford in the UK. She graduated from the Honors Tutorial College at Ohio University with a BA summa cum laude in philosophy and a minor in English. She received her Master of Arts in Philosophy and was the first to receive a PhD in philosophy from Villanova University in 1999. She has also earned a Master of Fine Arts in Poetry from Columbia University, a Master of Studies with Distinction in European Literature from St. Catherine's College, and a Doctor of Philosophy of Modern Languages and Literatures from St. John's College. Dr. Gassetti Ferenczi's interests include 19th and 20th century continental philosophy, philosophy of literature, and aesthetics. She has published many articles and books on these topics. Her publications include Exotic Spaces in German Modernism by Oxford University Press, The Ecstatic Quotidian, Phenomenological Sightings in Modern Art and Literature, Pennsylvania State University Press, Heidegger, Holderin, and the Subject of Poetic Language, Fordham University Press, and many others. Dr. Gassetti Ferenczi has truly excelled. Her book of poetry, After the Palace Burns, won the Paris Review Prize in Poetry. This book has been described, and I quote, as the stunning debut of Jennifer Anna Gassetti Ferenczi. Each line in this extraordinary collection of poems feels like the deliberate utterance of a strong, educated, and creative mind. Not only is Dr. Gassetti Ferenczi a superb scholar, but her teaching has been recognized by the Fordham University Undergraduate Teaching Award to the Arts and Humanities. She has won multiple honors, to mention just two. She has been named a Clarendon Scholar at Oxford, and she was honored with the John Titch Award for Excellence in Philosophy here at Villanova University. We are proud to welcome Dr. Gassetti Ferenczi back to campus for this well-deserved honor. Our most recent graduate, Mr. Ivan Inocetti, is from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He has worked on behalf of human rights and social justice causes both domestically and internationally. From helping earthquake victims to brainstorming ways to fight poverty in Rwanda, Ivan Lee has made it his mission to serve people in need. Ivan Lee is the founder of Hope for Haiti. He is a 2008 graduate from Villanova with a major in political science, a minor in history, and dual concentrations in peace and justice and Africana studies. He was selected as one of the year's 12 and Villanova's first new George M. Mitchell Scholar to study human rights law and transitional justice at the University of Ulster in Northern Ireland. He has earned a Master of Public Service degree at the William J. Clinton School of Public Service. Mr. Nasset's leading efforts for hope for Haiti organized 
post earthquake relief fundraisers and disaster preparedness initiatives in collaboration with the Clinton Foundation and the American Red Cross. Regarding Africa, Ivan Lee has worked as a research assistant with Bridge to Rwanda, where he has proposed higher education recommendations to the Rwandan Presidential Advisory Council. He has attempted to establish merit-based scholarships. In addition, he wrote concept notes for three new offices, International Student Cultural Exchange, Office of University Partnerships and Skill, and workshops on the modular system of higher education. He has also served as research assistant for the College Board Global Literacy Project in Philadelphia, co-authoring the published research report, Global Education, Connections, Concepts, and Careers. I can attest to Mr. Nasset's forceful writing style, having read his recent This Week article in the Huffington Post entitled, Get Active, Get Engaged, Get Informed. I agree with Dr. Maria Toyota, the former chair of political science and the current associate dean, her assessment of Ivan Lee was that when we look at Ivan Lee and the set, we are looking at a future world leader. Welcome. And I'd like to turn the program over to question and answer, or perhaps you folks would like to make some statements in terms of the experiences here at Villanova and how they impacted. I um I don't know that I need to tell you any more about myself after, uh, <laughs> after the introduction. Um, <clears throat> although I, I will tell you that my time at Villanova I never thought about uh, joining the Navy. I thought a lot about being a lawyer. Uh, my college roommate here was a nursing student. She went off to San Diego and I went to Temple. And listening to her talk about the Navy made me find out a little more about it. And I joined it uh, to become a district attorney in Philadelphia. Um, as you heard, we do military justice um, of all kinds, you know, defense, trial, and judging, um, although not all at the same time. Um, but we have a pretty diverse practice. Uh, in every area of the law, um, whether it's ethics, legal assistance for sailors and their families, environmental law, energy, international and operational law, um, cyber law, intel law. It's a broad practice and we look for lawyers who have um, broad and diverse experience uh, because we want to reflect the Navy and the Navy reflects America. Uh, but it isn't enough to just be good at what you do. Uh, we're looking for people who have uh, integrity and character, uh, moral courage, the ability to succeed as members of a team, and the ability to um, put service before self. And I think uh, the values that I learned here at Villanova um, really prepared me well for a career as a naval officer um, and, for an, and as an attorney. You know, the demand for um, academic and intellectual excellence, but also um, developing uh, moral character um, encouraging volunteerism and charity, making sure that you put other people's interests um, ahead of your own, and really fostering a spirit of community um, of Villanovans. So I feel uh, very, very well prepared. Um, and in fact, uh, the ROTC unit here has claimed to me as one of their own, even though I didn't go through ROTC. <laughs> and Villanova, I learned has produced uh, more generals and admirals than any university other than uh, the military academies. So I'm a proud Villanova graduate and happy to be here today. Thank you very much. Well, it's a, um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, really an honor to be with uh, my uh, co-winners uh, co here of the alumni medallion. But I have to tell you, um, it's quite a shock. It's quite a surprise, particularly because I came to Villanova to study engineering. And I did so well my freshman year, they asked me to come back and take some of the courses over again uh, during summer school. Having done that, uh, some very, very kindly um, 
Augustinian priest, and I see a few of them here. I, I think it was Father Burns. It was at the end of the summer, and he said to me, son, not everybody is cut out to be an engineer. Why don't you try something else? So I had enough of a cumulative average, just barely enough to become a sophomore, but I then switched into political science and actually, quite proudly, I think I managed to make Dean's List the rest of the uh, six other semesters, which was uh, quite an accomplishment after my uh, freshman year uh, cum in, uh, in engineering. So I did uh, actually believe father and you know that not everybody is cut out to be an engineer. Of course, I remember talking to my father and he said to me, look, I know what an engineer does, but what does someone with a political science degree do? And of course, I really didn't have a very good answer um, for him. As you heard, our family is originally from Cuba and people tended to go get a degree in something that you could actually go work on. You know, you would have been an accountant or a lawyer or a something, you know, that gave you a way to make a living. Well, I was very fortunate. I had a, a number of, of mentors um, and had the opportunity to work the following summer, by the way, while also going to summer school, um, uh, to make up some courses. I worked at Provident National Bank in Philadelphia, and that led to this 31-year career at, um, at what used to be called Chemical Bank, which became Chase, which became J.P. Morgan Chase, and had a you know, really pretty interesting, uh, pretty interesting life. But to reflect on some of the things that the Admiral was saying, you know, um, during my life, what did Villanova prepare me for? I, I really didn't learn about spreadsheets or analyzing credit or trying to learn, but, you know, I did learn an awful lot, or I believe, and more than, if this doesn't sound too, I, I got a lot of character. I got a lot of that moral courage, and I got a lot of the types of things that I believe would have served me well uh, and have served me very well in my life had I become an engineer, as I thought I wanted to be when I first came here, whatever a political scientist was going to be, maybe Ivan Lee can explain to me what a political scientist <laughs> does, the banker that I became, and then I had this incredible opportunity to serve my country when I was asked to join um, the Bush administration and work at the Department of Homeland Security as we were just literally standing it up. I mean, we were, uh, this was in the, in the just after 9-11, and trying to figure out what did the country need to do, and again, a lot of doing the right thing. And I want to say um, that that Villanova, and of course, uh, not to give all the credit to Villanova because I uh, now now passed away, but I have a wonderful set of parents who uh, helped get me to Villanova uh, and pay for it, and um, you know, just a wonderful family that has supported me all those years. But I believe that you know, Villanova was sort of the icing on the cake that gave me all of that character and that moral courage to do what I've done for the last 40 years or so. Well, first, thank you to all the faculty staff <coughs> here present today and for the kind introduction. I'm actually happy to hear your story about your journey because I have a similar story. My parents are from Haiti, your parents are from Cuba. You started as an engineer, I started as an engineer. There you go, see. Although I stayed for two years, not just for one. <laughs> Smart guy. <laughs> Until I saw the light and switched into political science. And, you know, Villanova, it didn't just teach me what to think, but it taught me how to think and how to serve. And that's, I think, the most important lesson that I take from my time here. Because when I reflect on what I've been doing for the last few years and what so many of my peers are doing and what they intend to do in the near future, our institutions here at home, they need reform. Whereas institutions elsewhere in the world, they need to be created. But those institutions need to be created in a way that respects the wisdom that those people and those nations have and people's cultures and their ways of life, the better aspects of them. And similarly here, there are lessons that we can learn from other parts of the world, and there are lessons that we can learn from communities within our own country that often are neglected or voices that are silenced. So Villan my time here at Villanova taught me how to serve because you have so many service learning projects where we go into the city and you know, go to charter schools and public schools and work with students who didn't have the same opportunities as many of the students at Villanova. Uh, many of the students who I grew up with, you know, where I come from in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and there were so many opportunities to go abroad and serve in countries, Habitat for Humanity, and many different organizations that do great work with the programs here at Villanova. 
So it's really an honor to be back here and to be with all of you who make all of this possible and to provide all these opportunities for the students here to, to serve and not what to think, but you teach them how to think. When I was a student here from 04 to 08, one of the mantras was transforming minds. I don't know if that's still on the brochures or anything now, but that I've always, that's always stuck with me because to me the mission of a university is to transform minds and to prepare young people to go out into society and to make it better. So whatever initiative they become involved with, whatever organization they decide to work for, that when that individual leaves the organization or looks back and reflects on their work with that initiative, they left it a bit higher, a bit more elevated and a bit better than it was before. And that we leave a better future for our children and grandchildren because ultimately everything that we do, it's not about us, but it's about everyone else together. Whatever we accomplish individually uh, is nothing compared to the people who made it possible. So that's, at this Augustinian University, that's the lesson that I hold most dear. And I'm thankful for my experience here. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction and, and to my fellow uh, awardees. It's really, and, and to you for coming, it's really quite humbling to sit here at this table with these incredibly accomplished people who have done so much um, and to uh, ensure the well-being of, of others and in such concrete ways. So I have to say something about um, work and a realm of activity which is much more um, elusive when you measure it from a concrete um, standpoint. And that is, of course, the life of the mind. Um, I came here to study philosophy. Um, if you want to know, you know, what your parents are going to say <laughs> when you come out with a major, um, philosophy is definitely one that's going to, you know, raise a few eyebrows. Um, I came here also as a graduate student, so I, I can't quite speak as directly as these uh, folks can about um, being shaped as a person at a particular time um, in one's development. But I can say, though I was a bit more informed as a person coming to Villanova, um, I blossomed here um, intellectually in a way that made everything that I've done since then possible. Um, being a graduate student here was, was a fascinating experience. I had um, very, very good teaching um, in a program that was devoted to a kind of philosophy that I thought was really important. Um, it was very difficult to say in what ways it was important for helping people in need, in what ways it was important for you know, ensuring our security, in what ways it was important in any, any practical sense. Um, but it seemed very important to me in terms of understanding the human condition and keeping alive our pride and efforts with regard to the kinds of human achievement um, that can be measured in practical terms. Um, so I was able to study at Villanova um, very intensely as a graduate student in a realm of thinking that I thought was really important. And the fact that I had a very excellent um, Professors, one of whom is here today, Professor Caputo, who was my doctoral dissertation advisor, um, was, uh, was really a joy. It was a real joy. I should also say that I learned to teach while I was here and uh, found that a fascinating experience as well because it gave me direct contact with Villanova undergraduates. Um, even though I was just about the same age as they were really, um, I had to be in a position of um, teaching them something that I myself was still learning to master. Um, but I found them, you know, inspiring. I still remember some of the students that I taught here as a graduate student, um, and I found it uh, very encouraging for thinking about my future career. Um, since leaving Villanova, as it was noted um, in the introduction, I've been at a lot of really remarkable institutions. Um, at Columbia and at Oxford. I um, met a lot of really quite amazing uh, people. Um, but to be honest with you, I think the, the most rigorous thinking I had to do happened at the time that I was here. And that's when 
I started to get a sense of what I was capable of intellectually and what I might contribute. Um, so I, I owe a lot to that time. Um, the fact that it's also a beautiful environment um, and that it's a beautiful environment surrounded by people with a love of learning um, is, is also something that I never take for granted um, and, I, and I think is a real privilege. Uh, so I hope that the students who are here now are able to savor it um, with, the, with the relish and make the most of it. Clearly, we have four marvelous awardees. Thank you very much. And now is an opportunity for folks to ask questions. It's, it's informal. So please. together. Um, I can start off. I would say yes, although I take your point. Um, just a few weeks ago we were, uh, I was doing a you know, meeting with some of our civilian employees and one of them made the same comment that, uh, you know, <clears throat> particularly now you hear a lot of negative things about government. And I said that that bothers me greatly. Um, because at the same time, uh, we hear such wonderful things about the military, and what are we? Well, we're in government service and service to our country. And I think government service in any way is extremely important and rewarding. And I, I think we need to tell our students not to let sort of the drumbeat of the day uh, get them down or change their desire to do good. One of the things that Villanova teaches you is to think independently. And I believe if someone wants to be part of something bigger than themselves, uh, to put the skills that they learn here to good use and to do work that's fulfilling and rewarding, um, to look at government service in, in, any, in any of its forms. Uh, because I think that they'll find that um, it dovetails very well with the experience they had here. Yeah, let, me, let me add something. Um, <clears throat> So I worked for, right out of school, I worked for 30 plus years uh, in banking and I dealt with the government quite a bit. Uh, frankly, I didn't like it. Most of the time they were coming in and they were telling me, to, you know, it was the FDIC or the OCC or the controller, you know, control the currency and so on and people telling me things that I needed to do. Um, having spent uh, the last few years in, in El Paso, Texas, um, you know, Juarez is right across the border, a lot of drug dealing. We would get asked by the FBI to take a look at accounts and, you know, report to them. And then when we went back to them and said, by the way, what do you want me to do? You know, it was like, what? Who? Did we, did we ask? No, did we ask you for that? Did not have a very high opinion of the government. Did not have a very high opinion. After joining the government as a political appointee, so just to give you a ratio, Department of Homeland Security today has 250,000 employees, approximately 195 of them, not 195,000, 195 of them are political. So they clearly are the group of people, you know, the secretaries are political, obviously, and the people that are, so you work with people that are career people. They're there, they've been there for years and years. I came away after a little bit over six years with an incredibly high opinion of government employees. Again, and I'm, I'm just being very open about it, I had this sort of idea, this doesn't have a paper clip, but I could sort of imagine people separating things and shooting the paper clip into the air, and that's what they must have been doing in government, okay? 
Um, that's not what they do in government. There are extremely dedicated people. Uh, by, by the way, an extremely dedicated um, uh, political appointees as well, trying to do the right thing. Uh, but, but you know, again, the, the bulk, the 99.9% .9 of the people in government are career. And so I've come away with a very, very uh, different opinion after having served for, uh, for six plus years. Um, having said that, you know, would I recommend it as a, as a career? And I was in, only in it again sort of later on in life and so on. Uh, I think my answer is yes. I've, I've had a chance to mentor a number of young people, both inside the government and subsequent to it. And I think it's really a great opportunity to give back. Um, I, I don't want you to think I'm some sort of a stand-up comedian, but I won one lottery in my life. That was I graduated in 1971. The war in Vietnam was going on, and I had number 177 in the draft the year that they called up to 171. So I didn't get drafted. And, and I, I've already mentioned I'm originally from Cuba, and I owe a lot to this country. My whole family owes a lot to this country. And so when I had the opportunity to serve, I saw it as an opportunity, even though later in life, to do something to give back for everything that's been given back. And so whether people do it because, by the way, they do have pretty good pensions and all those sorts of things, you know, that sometimes get, you know, overdone or overwrought, um, it is a great opportunity to, to make the country right and do the right kinds of things. One comment I'll make is many students and young people in particular, not students here, but young people who, don't, who aren't necessarily engaged, this relates to the Huffington Post article that you mentioned before that I wrote this week. We as citizens at times tend to vote, sometimes elect a certain politician and expect that individual to take care of all our needs or to advance our agenda. But that's not the deal. That's not really how our democracy is supposed to work. Government doesn't need to be this abstract, faraway concept where bureaucrats make decisions and control our lives. It should be us actively engaged, understanding the decisions that are made and impacting them. Um, whether you're conservative or liberal, if you're conservative and you believe in federalism to the T, states should be laboratories of democracy. And people should be actively engaged in debating, understanding the issues of the day, and ensuring that the decisions are made have a positive impact on their lives. And the federal government has responsibilities for protecting citizens as well. But regardless of where someone falls on the ideological spectrum, being a citizen, before even you consider whether or not you want a career covered public service and government service, being a citizen has certain duties. And at Villanova, we do a good job of ensuring that students get engaged. And when I was here, that's when President Obama was elected, and that was a special time because young people all over the country were active and engaged. But that needs to continue. That shouldn't be an exception. That should be the norm in a democracy. So civic engagement is something that, if you have the opportunity, I think you should stress, no matter what your discipline is, to your students, because it's something, as citizens, we should be actively part of and promote. And a life in public service, particularly if someone has a passion for it and knows what they want to accomplish, and would be an ethical decision maker, I think that's, that's a great career for an individual to pursue. So I don't see why we should discourage people from pursuing their goals and their passions. Please, Jane. Yeah, I'm going to sort of take a different tack from Adele, um, and we're still giving advice to our, our students in, in terms of what types of um, academic careers they um, pursue and, and majors. And I know there's two poets up there, because one of the things I did tell you is that he's also a poet. Um, and so I'm really kind of curious, you know, for, for students who have a strong penchant for um, the arts and for literature um, and for philosophy, um, you know, it's not something that is really valued very much, um, in a, you know, as a you know, career path, as, as it sort of alluded to. What kind of advice do you, do you give to a student Whose heart is taking them in that direction? Well, that's that's a question that comes up a lot for every professor of philosophy, as I'm sure for lots of professors in the humanities. Um, and it does have to do with you know what what is education for. Um, in a certain <coughs> aspect, I have to admit um, that educating oneself to have a life of the mind is a privilege, um, and it is um, something that we shouldn't take for granted. 
Um, there are really good reasons why people have to study uh, subjects that they think that they can um, get, you know, start launch a career and, and, and make a practical way in the world with. At the same time, I would suggest that um, studying a subject like philosophy allows a person to <coughs> develop a capacity for rigorous and critical thinking in a way that transcends the immediate application of a particular occupation or trade, um, but stays with one a whole life long. Um, a lot of the most successful people turn out to have studied subjects like philosophy um, precisely because uh, they are able not merely to absorb content um, and learn information, but also to think critically, as I'm sure um, all of these successful people have done in their own fields. Um, but in philosophy, of course, um, you learn to think critically and you learn to think creatively and you learn to think rigorously and you learn to think through the structures that make things work. Um, not merely what happens, but how they happen. Um, and you can do that, of course, in a lot of different disciplines. Um, the arts um, is, however, some, is, is a different question. Um, and in, in a way, the arts have a certain advantage over philosophy in that um, arts are inherently communicative. And although it rather seems impractical to pursue a career or a life being an artist or being a poet, on the other hand, um, you do have the advantage that all of the activity and endeavor that you engage in is directed toward communicating with others. And so you find, in fact, that there are communities of artists, there are communi communities of writers and poets, there are ways to make it in the world um, of the arts and literatures and the humanities, and there are ways as well to make those kinds of activities and those kinds of themes enhance other styles of life. Um, so they don't have to be mutually exclusive. Having a successful career um, doesn't have to exclude um, being a poet or being a writer. My favorite American poet, Wallace Stevens, was president of an insurance company in Connecticut. Um, impressive. So I, I have a question for you. So are you the advisors for the students, the faculty advisors and whatnot? I'm, well, <laughs> of a different sort, but yeah. yes. Yes, briefly. Yes. You know, we, um, part, of, part of my job is to ensure that we have a good pipeline of lawyers coming into the, to the JAG course. So we do a lot of, uh, we call them affinity group events. And we'll go to the American Bar Association, we'll go to different student groups, and we, we do panel discussions like this, and the students do come out in, in, in droves as they're trying to figure out how they can get a job, what they can do. Um, and frequently, you know, there is a military representative, a law firm, somebody from government, somebody from business. And you get the sense that the students are in a hurry to get their careers and their lives started. So I don't want to get sidetracked by going into the military or by going into government or maybe by doing what I really want to do for a few years because I have to get my career started. And I always say to them, and it, it's easy to say when you're older, and it sounds trite, but if you have a passion for something, I mean, your students ought to follow their passion. I mean, it goes by fast, as anybody with gray hair knows. It goes by incredibly fast. And for you students who are here, when you, when you find something that you like and that you enjoy, do that. Um, people will tell you otherwise. People are very happy to give you advice, but they don't have to live your life. You have to live your life. And you work hard. Do something you love. I mean, I'm in my last job in the Navy. It'll be over in three years. It's flown by. And I can honestly say I've loved what I've decided to do with my life. And it was not a popular decision in my home with my very traditional parents. Um, I could have made a lot of money doing other things, but I've loved what I've, the opportunities I've had. So if you have students that want to do something that maybe doesn't pay the bills as well or maybe sounds um, not as serious as their parents might want it to be, tell them to do it. Um, they, they don't get to make these choices uh, again. I, th I think that's a, a very interesting, can you all hear me back there without the microphone? 
Um, you know, that's a very interesting comment about what is success in life? You know, is it making money or, or is it accomplishing something? Or, you know, by the way, the work you're doing in Haiti, yeah. how can you put a price tag on some of that? Um, again, I forgive me for bringing up my Cuban background, but my grandmother would always say, and when, when my grandfather died, my father was 15 years old, he dropped out of high school and went to work. Okay, and she, we would talk about people, and especially after coming to the United States, somebody would say, oh, have you heard about such and such? Oh my God, he's made, you know, he's made a million dollars now that, you know, whatever, he's become a millionaire. And my grandmother would say, now look, let's not confuse, you know, a good family with anybody who's got money, right? I mean, so it was good if you were a good family and money, but, you know, don't confuse, those are two different things. The other side of it is what I was listening, you know, to Jennifer talk about, which is, I, I think you were referring to things like critical thinking and the like, you know, if I look back and I say, what did I learn, by the way, in grammar school, high school, Villanova, my MBA, what facts did I know that helped me do something at work? Probably not very much. I mean, there's some facts, some things I learned, but again, I learned how to think. I learned how to reason. I learned how to figure it out because that's what so much of life is about. Um, you know, being able to, I mean, talk about, you know, a lawyer all the time doing that, you know, on their feet, no less very often. But, you know, every day I get faced with problems that I have no idea. I, I live, I, sometimes, sometimes I don't even know what the subject is, okay? Anyone here, of course, this is pretty popular lately, but somebody came to me the other day on conflict minerals. You all heard about conflict minerals? Somebody brings up conflict minerals. I'm going, what, are, you know, what kind of minerals are those, you know? I did study about minerals in chemistry here at Villanova, but, you know. So, you know, what do we, so it's a matter of it is that process of thinking and reasoning and coming up with something that is, that is the right answer. So just a little added twist to all these questions about what do you do, you know, what am I going to do when I grow up? I'm still trying to figure that one out. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Many of us are, yes. Please. Um, I would just like to ask, along with critical thinking skills, which um, a few of you have mentioned, what are some other skills that you would advise you know, faculty to encourage in their students or students to try to develop in themselves, no matter what sort of interest they're pursuing, but what are some tangible skills that any arts and science student should take away from their education to be successful in whatever they choose? Can I give a very quick answer? Get a job at a restaurant or somewhere where you have to deal with the public, okay? You are going to be dealing with people all of your life, and those interactions are going to be some of the most important things that are gonna make you successful or not. And if you've had the opportunity to work, and I say a restaurant because you're constantly taking orders, oh, did I get that wrong? I thought you said medium rare. No, I meant, you know, overdone, you know, whatever, okay? I mean, you have to deal with those kinds of things. Now the answer from the philosopher. <laughs> Well, uh, as a professor, um, of course, um, we are often, professors are often thinking about, you know, what's, what do we really need our students to learn? Um, of course, we care about our subject matter, um, but we also care about the kinds of skills and uh, capabilities that we can encourage our students to cultivate while, they're, um, while, they, while they have this very privileged position of being able to devote themselves to their studies for four years. Um, I would say um, writing is extraordinarily important. Um, being able to write clearly and well and with depth and clarity um, is extraordinarily important. And being able to speak with clarity about your ideas is also extraordinarily important. And those are skills I think that you can cultivate in almost any course. Um, and should certainly be encouraged. The other thing I would suggest, and, and maybe this isn't always emphasized, um, is to have a mind for the historical conditions for the way we think. So um, be curious about how the problems that you're thinking about now came into being, and where the institutions and concepts and problems and, and, uh, and even, even disciplines um, got their origins. Um, if you're studying psychology, you know where psychology developed and in what centuries. 
um, it came to be uh, a real discipline in science um, and sociology know about the origins of that and how it compares to other fields. Um, so I suppose I want to say is don't focus only on the content, but on the context of what you're learning. I try not to give one-size-fits-all solutions to anyone because everyone is different. But something that many of us struggle with, myself included, is trying to live a balanced life. And that's something I imagine that most of us here are probably still trying to figure out. But it seems to me the older I get, the more important it becomes. Because it would be unfortunate for any student to fall into a position where you're doing something day in and day out, 8, 12, 16 hours a day, and you get home, you just want refuge from whatever you do. And you start to dislike what you do. And days become into months, months into years, years into decades. And it can take a heavy toll on a person. And I've seen what it does to particularly older people after a lifetime of it, it's very difficult. So us as students, we're privileged to pursue, at least to an extent, what we like and what we think our passions are. Many people, I'd say most people, don't have that opportunity. It's, it's, it's very rare. So we're privileged in that regard. So we should take advantage of it. And if we're lucky enough to find something that we love doing, to wake up every morning and to do it, and still get paid for it, and to do it in a balanced way, where, like Jane mentioned, if you love the arts, you can still read a novel. Um, my, <laughs> my professor, Dr. Toyota, she told me a couple weeks ago to buy a guitar. She told me, since you've been traveling recently, um, how, what do you do to you know, entertain your creative side? And I told her, well, I used to play the piano, and you know, I love poetry. She told me, well, piano doesn't travel very well, so let's get a guitar. <laughs> and something as simple as that, can be a creative outlet, and it can help someone live a balanced life. So, that's all I have to say. I think I would also tell you to do more than simply your academics. Um, I can't give you better advice than Jennifer did in terms of the other things that you ought to develop in terms of uh, writing and thinking and reading. But do other things as well. Whatever extracurricular activities interest you, because in life, you never, ever have the luxury of just doing one thing at a time. Hmm. And it's, it, it helps you with that. It helps you juggle things. It helps you use your time well. And I think it, it brings out sort of the human connections that we're all talking about. Um, that's, that's part of the college experience that you ought to take advantage of. And when you get out there and you start working, um, don't make your life be all about work. I mean, continue to do some of those things that you found most enjoyable here. Um, all of the volunteer activities that are available at Villanova, it's just, it's just incredibly rewarding. Um, get involved in those things. Yes, just kind of bring back on the question. Um, as a student, besides your academics, what other um, like extracurricular activities were you involved in that really helped you along your journey, or that kind of helped like, coincide and help you grow as a leader, um, or just as a person? I was a coxswain for the crew team, so I woke up at 4 o'clock every morning and told eight men what to do. For <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Um, uh, yeah, I was involved in club sports. I'm a proud Alpha Chi Omega uh, sorority sister. Um, and uh, through the sorority, we did a lot of volunteer work in Philadelphia. We tutored, we tutored kids. We did Special Olympics. We, we you know, adopted a nursing home and visited the folks there. Um, all of those things helped me. I, I can honestly say that, frankly, sports was one of the things that has helped me incredibly in my career. It teaches you teamwork. It teaches you leadership. It teaches you to be selfless and responsible um, for people other than just you. Uh, it makes you conscious of bringing out the best in the people that you work with. Um, and it forces you to use your time well, uh, because you have to devote your time to practice and study. Um, but it isn't just competitive sports. It can be a debate club. Uh, for law students, it's law review. It can be a team sport. Uh, anything that you do with other people um, for a common purpose, uh, I think, uh, can help you incredibly later in your life. I was a swimmer and um, was um, 
uh, in the Blue Key Society and was president of Delta Tau Delta. And uh, every one of those things for the kinds of things that the Admiral just said, you know, for various working with people, having to deal with conflicts, teamwork, all those things, they were all helped. I engaged in far too many extracurricular activities. <laughs> <laughs> So I won't even go through the list. There are too many to mention. But I was an RA, and uh, the cultural organizations, I was active in those. Service learning, volunteer projects, you name it, I probably did it. But if I could do it all over again, I'd probably just pick one or two that I really love. And the most rewarding ones were the ones where we went to Philadelphia, and we were part of a larger community. And that this campus, it, it becomes a bubble. It really does. And it's a great community. but. There's also a wider community that, if you have the opportunity to engage with, I think would be possibly rewarding. As a graduate student in philosophy, my extracurricular activity was more philosophy. <laughs> 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 and also teaching, of course, um, because the graduate students eventually learn to teach, and that's a really important, um, really important experience. Um, like I said, uh, graduate, school, graduate school is a bit different. Um, it's a bit more condensed rather than getting to explore a lot of different fields and a lot of different, having a lot of different courses and different things. Uh, you kind of are making a commitment to a particular subject matter and even eventually a particular theme within that subject matter and you must live, eat and breathe it for, for a few years. Um, so more philosophy, more philosophy, more philosophy. Um, <laughs> I did write poetry um, as a way, perhaps, to um, engage the imaginative part of my mind in a way that didn't subscribe to the kind of rules of rigorous thinking that you have to do in philosophy and that kept me open to the possibility of other ways of experiencing the truth. Yes, Bob. I'd like to continue this uh, reflection by asking how in your uh, personal or professional lives, are, were you able to balance your personal lives, uh, family and so forth? Um, because the le lessons you learned here obviously carry on into, into life. So maybe you could just share a little bit of how you've managed your professional life with your other social and familial responsibilities. I'm not always as good at that as I want the lawyers in the JAG court to be, I'll be honest with you. Um, I guess I always look at it and I say it, it all tends to even out. Uh, day to day, I don't always feel like I strike the right balance. But when I look overall and I look back on my career, even when I was overseas in Japan, I got home for every major event. Um, I made time in my life for the things that were important to me. and. I belong to an organization that, despite what you might think about us having to, you know, always be ready, always be there, uh, be forward deployed. We, my personal philosophy as a leader is there's 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week. We're on duty all of that time, but we're also there for each other. So if you're fortunate enough to be working in an office ashore instead of at sea, and your children are playing soccer, or you know, somebody in your family is sick, or you want to go do something in the afternoon. We, we cover for each other, and we encourage that. Um, and you may not immediately be able to pay back and uh, support the people who supported you, but over the course of time, you're, you're allowing somebody else to spend time with their families or do the things they like to do. I mean, it just requires um, the ability to be flexible. Uh, maybe to work early in the morning so that you can leave in the afternoon and be where you need to be. Um, to be accessible. I have a love-hate relationship with my Blackberry. It allows me to not be at work um, and still keep up with work, but it does make work follow me everywhere I go. Um, but I'll tell you, I, I, uh, I wouldn't trade it in um, because I can be what people need me to be from almost anywhere that I am. And that allows me uh, to keep up with the commitments in my life. Yeah, let me answer that question. I have three children. The oldest was born in New York. The second one was born in Manila in the Philippines. The third one was born in Mexico City. Um, I owe a lot to my late wife, who uh, was a wonderful partner and was able to 
you know, raise the kids and, and, and not that I didn't help, but, you know, I mean, she was really there all the time. And I did have the kind of job, despite a demanding travel schedule and all those things that I think we found even, even though it wasn't the Navy, that, you know, people would cover for you and people knew when you had a little league game and you had a, you know, the, whatever it was, you know, that you needed to do with the kids, you know, you had people helping to cover for you. Um, it's funny that the Admiral talks about the Blackberry. I carry two Blackberries. Uh, very old school to have a Blackberry. Uh, but I learned about them in the government, and I, I do a lot of typing, and my thumbs get very sore. But uh, when I was uh, running our office in Mexico City, I would come up to New York on vacation, and my secretary, back when we still had secretaries, now they're called administrative assistants, but um, it would mail me a package of information every few days, and I would get it, and I would dread it, and I was in the middle of vacation, but we didn't have another way of communicating. You know, we used to use telexes if you were in the office, but if you're out in, at the beach, it was hard to get, and so it, it was a sort of, and I have learned also to have this love-hate relationship, which I would not give up, because it does allow me tremendous flexibility, and so those are some of the things that you have to, you know, give up and just try to come up with, with some balance. I'm 25, unmarried with no children, so. <laughs> and you don't have a BlackBerry. I bet you have and an iPhone. And I don't iPhone, have a BlackBerry. Right? I have an iPhone. Oh, wow. <laughs> that was you once. <laughs> well, um, it, the balance is never perfect. You never feel like you're putting your energies in the right place because there's always somewhere else that needs you. Um, I don't have a BlackBerry. And I don't know if that helps. Um, there's one less sort of being beeping at me. Um, I have plenty of demands on my time. Um, I never feel like I have the right balance, but I've learned to accept not being perfect and um, just giving everything that I do my best. That's a very good point. Is there any other questions? Our time is actually. Thank you so much for...